This is Bishop Dale Broder. Thank you so much for joining our YouTube channel today. If this is a blessing to you, I want to encourage you to like it and then click the subscribe button and then turn on notification. Hit that little notification bell so that you never ever miss another one of our videos. And then if you're in the Metro Atlanta area on a Sunday, check out one of our exhilarating services at 8.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 6 o'clock p.m. Our scriptural text today comes from Joel chapter 3, verse 9 and 10. Notice that these words, Proclaim this among the nations. Prepare for war. Rouse the warriors. Let all the fighting men draw near and attack. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weakling say, I am strong. Today we are speaking from the subject, a time for warriors. A time for warriors. This is a prophetic word. This is not a word because I ran out of other stuff to talk about. But this is a divine word from God and I want you to be able to hear it with anointed ears, prophetic ears, to be able to hear a prophetic word of the Lord because this has to do with the timing of God and the seasons of where we are in our life right now. Discernment is absolutely necessary to know when one season has ended and a new season has begun. I want you to understand that wisdom is doing the right thing in the right season with the right people. Wisdom is doing the right thing in the right season with the right people. That's wisdom. And it takes wisdom to know when a season has shifted, when a season has changed. You'll notice from Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1 and then verse 8, for everything, there is a season and a time for every activity under heaven. There's a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. Notice that. It takes discernment to know when your system has shifted, when the, the time or the season has shifted. It's time to do something differently because you do different things in different seasons. Uh, you need to know if you're going to a different part of the world, whether it's going to be summer or winter. I cannot assume that where I'm going is going to be just like the place that I'm leaving from. There have been times, so many times, that I will intentionally plan my travels when I'm going globally to minister. I want to go somewhere hot when it's cold here. So I'll go places under the equator where the seasons are inverted. And so it's our winter time, but it's their summertime. And it would be foolish of me to arrive showing up there in big, heavy, bulky coats. And then I get there and it's 80, 90 degrees. And so you have to know the season where you are going, the season that you're in, so you know what to do. And notice the prophet Joel is speaking here prophetically to the children to the, uh, of Israel and saying to them as he's speaking to Judah, he's saying to them, listen, it is time now to take your plowshares and your pruning hooks. These are things that are used to harvest. This is for harvest, your plowshares. You use this to plow up the ground. This is for harvest. This is for productivity from the earth to receive the harvest. A pruning hook. You use that in fishing. You use this to be able to fish and to get the harvest of the sea. One is the harvest of the land. One is the harvest of the sea. And he says, listen, it's time now to take the harvesting tools and to beat them, change their forms, convert them into war weapons. Weapons of war because it's wartime. And you will miss God if you are in a harvesting mentality when you need to be in a defense posture of actually fighting a war. You're in warfare because you realize my life is under attack. And the devil has unleashed an attack on the church. He's unleashed a, an attack on the people of God. He has unleashed an attack where he's opened up with both barrels. Coming on your emotional health your psychological health, your familial health, your relationship health with spouse, 
relationship with uh, parents and their children. I mean, during the course of the pandemic, there has been such an increase of domestic violence between husband and wife, spousal relationship, domestic abuse between parents and their children, all kinds of things that have happened on a financial uh, level, people that have come into con contention with their, their neighbors. We've got the, the vaxxers and the anti-vaxxers. We've got Republicans against Democrats. We've got black against white. We've got nation against nation rising with all kinds of things. There's a war going on. This is a time for warriors. This is not the time to be laughing and playing and frolicking around. It's wartime now. I just want you to understand that when the season shifts, you got to realize that God, I've got to prepare myself and arm myself for battle now because I need to defend myself because all hell is turning itself against decency and morality and godliness and your family and your marriage in the name of Jesus. It's time to war for our sons and our daughters. It's time to war for our grandchildren. It's time to war for our freedom. It's time to war. We've gotten addicted to all kinds of crazy pornography, internet kind of stuff, digital. We need a digital detox. It's war time because so much has happened in our world. And I declare to you by the word of the Lord, I hear a sound in heaven. There's a trumpet that is blowing and it is war time. This is a time for warriors. It's not a time to be afraid. I'm a soldier in the army of the Lord. He is the battalion in chief and he is the one that commands us to say get up and pray. He says rebuke the wind, rebuke the works of the enemy. He declares to us in the name of Jesus though weapons are formed against you they will not prosper. That's because there is an interceder that stands in the gap. An interceder standing in the gap and says, Devil, not on my watch. Touch somebody and say, not on my watch, not on my watch, not on my watch, not in Jesus' name, not against my mind, not against my body, not against my marriage, not against my money, not against my children, not against my land, not on my watch. Not in my school district, not in my neighborhood, not on my watch. It's war time. It's a war cry. But I hear in the, in the realm of the spirit, it's a sound of victory. It is a sound of victory. Were the people of God marching forth in unity, submitted to the voice of the Lord? I declare that if you'll follow his voice, God will give you divine victory in the name of Jesus. Don't be afraid of what the world has coming against you right now. Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing has happened unto you. But in this, take confidence. Somebody shout confidence, confidence, confidence. It's the word confideo. It actually means with faith. My God, I've never seen so many pusillanimous, a timid, spineless individuals that are coming out and God said, if you're scared, go back home. It's time now for courage to rise in the hearts of the people of God that says, I'm built for this. I'm built for this. For God I live and for God I'll die. I am built for this. I declare in the name of Jesus, you're built for this. You're built for warfare. Not to war to be cantankerous and to be contrary, but to war to be right. To war to have your household brought in order in the name of Jesus. Things have been running amok now. I mean, mothers have lost their minds. Daddies have lost their minds. Grandmamas have lost their mind. It's time now. It's war time. It's war time. There's a war going on. And God's calling us back to normalcy and decency and holiness. God, some things really don't get old. You might call holiness old-fashioned. I call it God. And he's just calling us because there's a war cry calling us. Saying, come back. God's calling us. God's calling us. God's calling us. It takes discernment to know when the season has shifted. It takes discernment. I want you to notice the word of the Lord in 1 Chronicles chapter 12 and verse 32. And the children of Issachar, 
which were men that had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. When you have discernment, you understand the time and you know what to do. You understand the time and you know what to do. An alarm has gone off in the spirit. It's like in the natural, when your alarm clock goes off, you're, you, you know what time you set it for, you, so you know what time it is. If you set it for 6 a.m. and your alarm clock goes off at 6 a.m., you know what time it is and you know what to do. You wake up so you can get up. And so Israel, these sons of Issachar, the children of Issachar. And today I want us to be children of Issachar. To where we can read the signs of the time and we know what to do. We know what time it is and we know what we ought to do. We know what time it is and we know what we ought to do. We know what time it is and we know what we ought to do. Understand the times and understand what needs to be done. And the message to us is to do, th to do this, is to use what you have. Use what you have. Because see, it was wartime and they had harvesting equipment. So the prophet Joel says, beat your plowshares into spears, your pruning hooks into swords. He says, I want you to change the form of it. Convert it. You got to use what you have. When people go at, at war against you and you don't have anything, you start making, uh, you know, these little water kind of, this is the thing, they, they make their own little bombs. They, they come out with knives and pick forks and, and they come out with axes. I mean, they come out with whatever they have. They're going to come out with it. If, if it's a shovel, if it's a hole, you use whatever you have and turn what is a tool into a weapon. And this is what he said, discern the season, discern the time. So you'll know what time it is and it's time to convert, make a conversion. Use what you have. You may not have a weapon, but take a tool and make a weapon. And this is what he told him. Don't have any excuses. This is not a time for excuse. It's not time for an excuse. They've told you, you know, if you're ever in a situation and that there's an active shooter, they tell you how to get down and hide first. But then they say, if it's more aggressive, they start saying, use whatever you have. If you got some, throw it on them. If you got some, a, a ball of alcohol, throw it on them. Try to throw it in the eyes. If you got some cayenne pepper, throw it on them. You got to use whatever you got. If it's a shoe, you pull it off, throw it. Whatever you got. You got I mean, whenever you get in a, in a real pickle, you take something that wasn't even used or made as a weapon. And here it comes. Here it comes. A, a pot, a pan, a baseball bat, a golf club. My baby brother, he and his wife, they had seven children. And he was like, this is a few years ago. And, and, and they heard something downstairs. And she, she said, go down and check it out. He didn't have any weapons at home. So he, he goes creeping down the steps with a golf club. That had to be his weapon. Now, he know he wasn't going down there to play golf and to hit a ball. But he was going with what he had. You got to use what you have. Touch him out and say, use what you got. Use what you've got, use what you've got, use what you've got, and do what you can. Use what you've got and do what you can. You come in here, you're going to have a frying pan print on your forehead. <laughs> Even if you don't have anything else, all you can do is hide behind something and stand there with your frying pan. you got to take what you, use what you've got, because when you know you're in a war, the rules change. And you got to use what you've got. Because we're in a war now. We're in a war. And God's trying to get us prepared for victory in this war. But you've got to know the season. And it's a dangerous thing to be walking around and thinking that you're in a harvest season when you're in wartime. I just came to let you know by the Spirit that it's wartime now. Spiritual warfare is the cosmic war of good versus evil. And this is where we are. Spiritual warfare. It is the cosmic war of good versus evil. Spiritual warfare is a daily battle. Spiritual warfare, it is a daily battle between God and Satan. It is a daily battle between the kingdom of God and the world systems that are ruled by our spiritual enemy. I mean, it is a daily battle of the indwelling of the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life and the lusts of the flesh. The spirit is willing and the flesh is weak. There's a war every day in your flesh 
a war of doing things that you shouldn't do, of saying things that you shouldn't say, of eating things that you shouldn't see. Every day is a battle. If you're trying to lose weight, if you're trying to stay healthy, and if you know that this is not good for your cholesterol, you got to try to beat your flesh down. It's a battle every day. And I want you to realize God's kingdom versus Satan's kingdom. There, there's a vast difference of God's kingdom versus Satan's kingdom. God's kingdom is built in love. The devil's kingdom is built in fear. Fear. Perfect love cast out all fear. God's kingdom is built in trust. The devil's kingdom is built in distrust and suspicion. God's kingdom is built in fulfillment. The devil's kingdom is built in frustration. It comes from the Latin word frustrare, which literally means to deceive. Because whenever the devil gets you frustrated, he is deceiving you into believing that what God has said concerning you is not going to come to pass. God's kingdom is built in generosity. The devil's kingdom is built in greed. God's kingdom, God's kingdom is built in clarity. The devil's kingdom is built in confusion. He's always stirring up confusion. Always trying to mess up people's mindsets. God's kingdom is built in obedience. The devil's kingdom is built in rebellion. It's just a whole difference in how they vibe. God's kingdom is established in freedom. It produces a freedom where the spirit of the Lord is. There's liberty. There is a freedom that comes. But when you're dealing with the kingdom of the devil, it, it brings bondage, enslavement, addiction, the devil promises to please and to satisfy, but he only seeks to serve, to enslave, and to dominate. So God grants freedom. The devil wants to make you a, a slave, a bondage, a slave to digital a toxicity, a slave to drugs, a slave to alcohol, a slave to sugar. He wants to make you a slave to certain things, pornographic images going through your mind. He wants to make you a slave to it. The devil's uh, God's kingdom is built in wellness. The devil's kingdom is built in sickness and disease. God's kingdom, God's kingdom is built in harmony. And the devil's is built in discord. He's always stirring up something, always calling, causing trouble. God's kingdom is characterized by creativity. The devil's kingdom is characterized by imitation. God's the creator. The devil is the imitator. For everything genuinely that God creates, the devil creates a counterfeit. He's a counterfeiter. He's, he's, uh, he's stealing God's intellectual property of his creativity. The kingdom of God is built in purpose. And the kingdom of the devil is built in just uh, pleasure that is misguided. It's aimless pleasure. Just trying to have fun. Some people think that they are on the earth just to have fun. And God's kingdom is built in peace. And the devil's kingdom is built in stress and anxiety. Kingdoms in conflict. Kingdoms in conflict. And God's trying to bring us to establish the kingdom of God here in the earth. We just receive it. We don't make the kingdom. It's God's kingdom. He's already built the kingdom. And let me just tell you this. Whenever you're trying to build something in God, you can't build it while you're confused and stressed out. You build it in peace. The kingdom of God is established in peace. And sometimes the very things that you don't want to lose are the very thing that's costing you your peace. Let me say that again. Sometimes the very things that you don't want to lose are the very things that's causing you your peace. I want to ask you some questions. How can you tell if you are experiencing spiritual warfare? How do you know? I mean, I do realize that problems are normal to life. If you live long enough, you're going to have problems. You'll be young. You may, you may not have any problems initially, but you keep living. And what you never took a thought of, you take your knees for granted until you get a certain age. You take your hips for granted until you get a certain age. You take your mind for granted until you get a certain age. And so it may not be a problem now, but it, it may present you with some challenges down the road. But how can, you, how can you tell if you are experiencing authentic 
spiritual warfare from just the everyday problems of life. Problems are normal to life. I, I realize that. And I acknowledge that problems are normal to life. But when you're under spiritual warfare, it's, it's just different than the regular everyday problems of life. Here, here's some distinguishing factors. Number one, attacks of physical danger, illness, or life-threatening loss. Whenever that happens, attacks of physical danger, illness, or threatening, uh, you know, life-threatening loss. Because remember the, the, the scriptures Jesus told us in uh, St. John chapter 10 and verse 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But he says, I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. To give us that abundant living. But he, uh, he's identifying for us that the thief, the devil, Satan, slew foot, whatever you want to call him. He only comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. So when you come under attacks of physical danger, illness, or life-threatening loss, that's an indication that your life is coming under some kind of spiritual uh, warfare, a spiritual attack. And you see, there are three general reasons why things happen. Things happen for doing, for doing what's right. You do what's right and you get persecuted. I mean, just bad things that happen just because you did what's right. You tell the truth, then you get in trouble. You know, you say, well, come here, I'm going to whip you anyway. <laughs> you tell the truth. I mean, I was pulled over. Uh, I wasn't even driving. My wife was driving. The police officer pulls us over. And then he comes over to my side of the window and asks, he says, sir, did you have on your seatbelt? Well, it was on when he got over there. Don't you, I said, like, you see it on, don't you? And then he asked me, he says, did, did you have your seatbelt on? And see, and here I am trying to be honest Abe. And I tell him, no, sir, I didn't have it on. He gave me a ticket. I got a ticket sitting in the passenger seat in the, for telling the truth. And so sometimes it seems like bad things will happen for doing what's right. Now, we know that bad things happen for doing what's wrong. You know, you spend a night over somebody's house, you had no business over there. Because you know what you were doing. And then you come out and your car won't start. You're like, okay, Lord, you know, my bad. You got me. You got me. Now you got to call an Uber home. So you, you, we, we, we suffer for, for doing right. You suffer for doing wrong. But then thirdly, you suffer for no apparent reason. For no apparent reason. We can't even figure out. It's like, Lord, I mean, I went to church. I was praying. I, I paid my tithes. Lord, I read my Bible. Lord, I told someone about you. And the car still won't start. So now what? What, what does this do to? I mean, what do you do when you are doing everything right that you know to do? Trying your best to live right and then something bad still happens. Because sometimes you'll suffer for no apparent reason. And it's a part of spiritual warfare trying to rob you of your joy. Rob you of your joy. I, I'll never forget my mother was uh, driving some years ago to go and bless another old lady who was in her home and she was just too old to get out. And my mother went and spent a great deal of money and bought bags and bags of groceries. And she's on the expressway going to this woman's house to drop off the groceries. And all of a sudden, while she's doing good, trying to bless an old lady, blue lights come. She's pulled over. My mother just broke down and started crying. Because she's like, Jesus, I'm trying to be a blessing to somebody. Else. Why you let this happen to me, God? Why you let this happen to me? Now, I could imagine that she would have felt okay and understood that it was justified had she been going to do something evil or wicked. But she's going to bless an old widow woman. And taking her car was loaded up with groceries. And she'd taken her time to go to the grocery store and load her car down with groceries and take it over to a widow woman who was homebound. And, and, and now in the process of trying to get there, my mother was singing and uh, just not even aware of what was going on. She was just singing in the car as she was driving. And here come blue lights and pulls her over. They're just doing their job. But here, it seemed like she was suffering for doing what was good. But sometimes it's for no apparent reason. And oftentimes, it's an indication of spiritual warfare. Remember Daniel? 
that was put in the lion's den, he hadn't done anything wrong. Daniel feared God. And the only reason that he was put in the lion's den is because he refused to bow to the king's demands of worshiping this idol that he had set up. And he prayed three times a day being devout in his religious devotions to God. And in the midst of that, he gets found out and now they bring him and and sentence him to death. So they put him in the lion's den. But because he had been in spiritual warfare, God closed the mouths of the lions And he used the lions as his pillow and slept all night. And they came the next morning expecting to see his body ripped to shreds. And he's there sleeping like a baby in a lion's den defying nature. The same thing happened with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were not put in the fiery furnace for being disobedient to God. They were put in there for being disobedient to man. They honored God. And because they honored God, the world systems got upset. And they're like, how dare you? And threw them into the the fire. It was heated seven times hotter. So hot that the men who threw them in were consumed by the fire. And then now when they go into the fire, God supernaturally preserves them. And then when they came out, not even their hair was singed. And not only that, they didn't smell like smoke. God says, if you'll walk with me. That though you go through warfare, you won't look like what you've been through. You won't smell like what you've been through. When you give them your testimony, they will look at you and say, hey, not you, not you. They won't even believe that you have been through what you've been through. But there are some things that, that come to threaten your life. And so Daniel had a life sentence, a death sentence rather. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had a death sentence. And yet they were honoring God and God preserved them because it was spiritual warfare. And my question to you is what is threatening your life or your well-being? It could be a demonic warfare. Here's number two. Sudden or extreme onslaught of various trouble, losses, and trials. Have you ever just had just sudden extreme onslaught of just various kinds of troubles and losses and, uh, and trials that happen to you. I mean, one thing after another, you can't find your keys. You get up trying to fix your hair and then you get out and it starts raining and messes up your hairdo that you pay an arm and a leg for. Your lashes have... Uh, you got the individual mink lash one, one at a time and... And now here it's it's coming after you with a vengeance. And you get out of the car dressed to the nines and and, and, and you nick your stockings and now you got to run in your stockings and and, and you wonder, God, what's going on? Excuse me, what's going on? And then the the flat, the tire's flat on the car or the car won't start. Or you go to your your washing machine and your washing machine has conked out on you. And and, and then you're having a problem with the refrigerator because it's not cooling. And, and then you go, I mean, that was uh, uh, one minister, and he had been traveling as a, as a road evangelist, and he told me, he said, you know, I, I was having so much trouble. He said, uh, my air conditioning went out in my, ho- in my house. I got in the car, the air conditioning went out. When he got to the city where he was going, he got to the hotel, the air conditioning went out. <laughs> now, it was, it was just an onslaught of negative things, and it just had everything to do with the air conditioning just going out everywhere. And, and, and it took about the fourth time that he got into a situation and there's no air conditioning. He realized this is not just a coincidence. This is a, de- a, a demonic warfare trying to get up under my skin and ruffle me and distract me and aggravate me. And so he realized this is not just mechanical failure. There's a demon spirit behind this that's trying to vex my soul to get me out of position with God so I can't do my God assignment. What is it that the devil is trying to frustrate you, frustrate you with so that he deceives you into believing that God has forsaken you and this is why bad things are happening to you? No, the bad may be happening to you because you're right in alignment with God, because you've said yes to him. Sometimes it's not until you get saved and try to really start living right for God that all hell seems to break loose. And as long as you are out there serving the devil and doing all kind of wicked and twisted and nasty thing, it seemed like everything was going all right and offers were coming. And the minute that you get sold out to Jesus, all hell breaks loose. And he assigns demons in different places to just start attacking you 
and you meet people that you've just a meeting for the first time and they got an attitude with you as though y'all have history together. It's that the demons in them don't like the Holy Ghost that's in you. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You didn't do anything to them. You didn't say anything to them. You just meet them and somehow they don't like you and looking down their nose at you as though you are, are some type of refuse that came out of an animal. And they don't like you and you have no explanation as to why they don't like you. Maybe, just maybe, this is spiritual warfare. Maybe this is the same thing where Jesus said that the world is going to hate you because they hated me first. And if you're going to follow me, the word, you better arm yourself likewise with this mind because bad things, demonic things, op opposition is going to come against you because Jesus said they came against me. This is not about you. This is bigger than you. That's why they got the attitude with you and you just got on that job and they looking at you funny and you just moved in that neighborhood and they looking at you funny and you just got in that school and they looking at you funny. This doesn't have anything to do with you. This has everything to do with a demonic spirit that gets agitated by the anointing of God that rests on your life. But you have to recognize that we're in a time of war. It's war time. It's war time. So there's a sudden or extreme onslaught of barriers, troubles, and losses, and, 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 uh, and trials that, that come your way. You get bad news from every corner in your own life, in your own emotions. Just dealing with an onslaught of things. And as soon as this happens, then that's happening. And now you've got spousal issues. Now you've got children, issues with your children. And then you call, and mama calls and now she's sick. And it's one thing after another. And then you get a tax bill. And now the insurance company won't pay the claim. And now somebody who owed you money won't pay you back. Oh, my God. And the devil reminds you about it because you see them and they act like they don't even owe you money when they out balling, ordering steak and lobster and they owe you an all. So you can still get your nails done and your lashes done and you owe me no sheep. <laughs> an onslaught, an onslaught. Well, see, that happened to Job. The Bible says that Job, God said concerning Job that he was a righteous man that walked upright before God and he eschewed evil. This was a righteous man and all hell broke loose in his life and it wasn't because he hadn't done anything bad. He had not done anything bad. And yet here he is in his house one day and all of a sudden, here comes a, a bearer of bad news saying, you know what, all of your children, your 10 children were in a house together. The house collapsed and all of 10 of your children are dead. Before that person could finish good, here comes another messenger in who's saying, you know what, all of your cattle that you own, this, this represents his whole stock portfolio, his net worth. It's all been wiped out. They said, your cattle is destroyed. They're gone. This is all of your sign of wealth. Before he can deal with that, you know, he's then, he then comes up with boils on his body. His own physical health now challenged. And the only thing that he was left with was a nagging spouse. Reminding him of how terrible he was. You call yourself a man. This all you are. You got a blouse. You, you, where, where the money now? <laughs> Looking at him crossways. Left with nothing. But why, why didn't the devil take her? <laughs> but he left her so she could vex him. Because she didn't understand that she was now being a tool. In his hands. And sometimes the people that are closest to you. Can be used as tools and not even know it. But all of this was an onslaught that happened in Job's life. To lose all of his possessions. Everything that represented wealth to him was lost overnight. All ten of his children died. His health fled him. And yet Job said, naked came I into the world, and naked am I going to go out. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He didn't even understand why this was happening. He didn't understand that there was a cosmic war 
The, the devil had said to, to the Lord, you know, Lord, you know the only reason that your people serve you is because you bless them. The Lord said, that's not true. He said, have you considered my servant Job? He's a righteous man. He's not serving me because of what I gave him. If I took it away, he'll still love me. Because if you're just loving God for the things that he's done for you, he's not Santa Claus. If you're just loving him because he blessed you with a house and a, and a, and a husband or a wife and because he gave you degrees, because you, you, you got this and you got that and you got the other thing. If you're just loving him only because of what he has blessed you with, you're missing it all together. Because if you lose that, what do you do when you get old and you don't have any of the stuff that you used to have? Uh, is your love going to decrease for him, what do you do if you, if you do get sick? Do you stop loving God just because you don't enjoy the same vibrancy of health that you used to have? Let God be God and every man a liar. You still love him. And God says, I got some people in the earth that will love me even if they lose everything. They know I'm the one that gave them the job. They loved me before I, they had the job. That's why I gave them the job because I love them. It, they didn't love me because I gave them the job. They loved me before they had the job. They didn't love me because I gave them money. They loved me before they had money. God already has tested and tried your character to know whether or not it would corrupt your soul. And then he says, this one is mine. This is mine. And so that's an onslaught of just one thing after another. It's where the enemy, the devil, buffets you. To buffet means to give one blow after another. And have you ever felt... That you were in a war and you didn't know what you had done to deserve it or to open the door for all of this onslaught of demonic attack in your life. But it's coming one blow after another. And before you can, can recover from this one, you, you're staggered by another thing that hits you. And as soon as you pay this thing off, this breaks down. And now you got to take the money that you thought you were going to be able to save 15 cents. And now you got to use that money from this thing that you paid off in order to fix this. And what do you do in the midst of that? And you realize this is not normal. This is satanic. God is trying to let us know today it's wartime. This is a time for warriors, not warriors. Where you get on your knees and reminding God about all of the problems in your life. This is not about worry. And you want to call that prayer? No, no, no. Don't, don't worry on your knees and call it prayer. Prayer is really when you stand on the word of God and you begin to decree and to declare and you plead the power of the blood of Jesus. There's still power in the blood and you begin to plead that blood over your spouse, over your children, your son and your daughter. You plead the blood in your neighborhood. You know they're selling dope down the street. And they're doing this. Got a meth house over here. But you better plead the blood over the school district. You better learn to plead the blood and take authority in the name of Jesus and declare, not on my watch. Not on my watch. Not on my watch in Jesus' name. He just needs some warriors to be able to stand and represent him in the gap. That's all that he needs is just warriors. Here's number three is an increased temptation and luring towards sin or wrong choices. You just get an onslaught of them. An onslaught here of, of increased temptations and luring towards sin or wrong choices. The devil knows what you like and he'll sort of sending these people into your life. Hit, all of a sudden they come slide into your DMs. You've been the same person. They weren't running after you like that when you were in school before you got your weave and stuff. But now you cute. And you know it. And now you got somebody like, let me holler at you. And they messing with you. And you got a love hunger because when you were younger, nobody ever told you how nice you looked. And something on the inside of you was saying, I want to be wanted. I want to be desired. I want to be affirmed. And now you're thirsty. Oh, he knows how to bring just the right one. I mean, if the devil is going to really send an agent into your life to seduce you and to uh, dismantle your faith, he's not going to send a snaggletooth <laughs> cul-de-sac kind of a person in your life to do it. He knows exactly what you like. Swole. He knows. Exactly what you like, bow-legged. He knows. 
just what you're looking for. He knows. And that's what's going to come creeping in your life, bow legged and. But you better know what time it is. You better know there's a war going on. And I don't have time to be distracted by a decoy of the devil, a spy, a secret agent that's coming trying to throw my game off, messing up my prayer life, my devotion to God, my time to be able to serve the purposes of the kingdom of God, to be salt and light right where I am. It's a trick. It's a trick. Touch somebody say, it's a trick. But God wants you to be aware. He wants you to be able to be discerning so you know what's going on. And you know what time it is. Just an increase of temptation. It happened with Jesus. Matthew chapter 4. For 40 days, the devil wore him out with temptation. So I don't care how good you are. Don't ever think that you are above temptation. I don't care how spiritual you are. I don't care how many fasts you've been on. You will never be out of reach of temptation coming into your life. Never. I don't care who you are. And you know why? It's because while the spirit man gets sanctified and cleansed, you can never sanctify your body. That's why your body, your flesh has to be, it's got to be renewed. It's got to be cleansed. You, you got to have a repentance and a washing that's an ongoing process. In order to get certain things out of you, you got to do that as a, as, a, as a process of sanctification. It's like pedaling a bicycle. The moment that you stop pedaling, you fall. Sanctification is a process. He sanctifies us by his spirit and, and he's calling us. And you see, it's, it's the devil that's trying to get you two degrees at a time. He, he will never turn a person away all, all at once. It's one little thing that gets you discouraged. One little thing that gets you disappointed. One little thing that depresses you. And, and it's two degrees at a time. You see, because the, great, the devil's greatest weapon is patience. Patience. He's got nothing but time. He lies in wait. And he waits for the opportune moment. He knows he will wear women out on a Friday night. Saturday night. He will wear you out at a time when he knows that that's the time that you used to go out on your date. And now while you're sitting at home and nobody's there, here, here comes Slewfoot. Hey, what you doing? Yeah, I was just sitting by thinking, I mean, I know it's 1130, but you know, we ain't got to do nothing. You know how he works. Two degrees at a time. If you start out in California on a flight going to New York, that plane is following a trajectory of a path that is already charted for it. And they're dealing with latitude and longitude on the lines in the earth. And if you just take two degrees off, by the time that you make that trek that's nearly 3,000 miles away, by the time two degrees, if you take two degrees off, you'll find yourself down in South Carolina somewhere. If it's two degrees off, because it, it, it's not even enough to notice here. See, if he turned you all the way around, if, if you did a 180, you'd immediately know. You'd immediately notice it. But instead of turning you 180, he turns you two degrees to go from there to here. And you don't even notice it. And what happens is that the next generation then gets turned two degrees. And then the next generation, two degrees. And then they're way off target of the destiny the destination of where God called them to be. That's why God says, don't you add one jot or tittle to my word. Stand for truth because if you keep saying, I think that it's okay for us to do this. And so now if you begin to change it, and then your grandchildren change it another two degrees, and your great-grandchildren another two degrees, you're already six degrees off now, and protract that out for 200 years and see where you are. And then you'll wind off in a place lost, discouraged, and bewildered and wonder, what's wrong with me? And so the devil has a strategy of just going two degrees at a time because he's got nothing but time. He will let Adam and Eve go as long as he can get Cain and Abel. He goes generationally. The devil thinks generationally. 
He thinks generationally. That's why when a demon is cast out, he will say, I will go back to my house, the household. And the very addictions that I, I gave to mama and daddy, I now will bring those addictions and they will become the struggles of the son and the daughter. He'll let you go if he can get your children. Here's number four. Experiencing feelings of condemnation and guilt, deep confusion, or dulled spiritual awareness. See, again, he does it two degrees at a time. Remember Romans chapter 8 and verse 1? Now there is therefore now no condemnations to them that are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. And yet, he can start bringing feelings of condemnation, guilt, deep confusion. Remember, God's kingdom is built in clarity. The devil's is built in confusion. You start running with the devil and you'll lose the sense of your identity. You won't even know who you are. You'll be so confused in your own identity. You'll have dulled spiritual awareness because you stopped two degrees at a time. Well, you know, man, you, you ain't going to hell if I don't read my Bible every day. No, you won't go. If, no, it, no, it's not going to send you. If you miss a day of beating your Bible, you're not going to hell over that. But don't let that day turn into a week. Don't let that week turn into a month. And see, he gets you two degrees at that going. You, you know, you're too sleepy. You're tired. You're running late already. And he talks you out of the day. And then if he talks you out of another day, see, then he gets you on a series. See, it's, it's one thing to slip. is another thing to slide. The first time you do it, it's a slip. But if you don't get up, it's a perpetual fall in a downward direction. Slipping, sliding into hell. And there are people all over America, all over the world, sliding into hell from a church pew. Because of mediocrity in their soul and compromise. And God is saying, listen, you got to hold to the truth. You got to hold to truth. Truth is an anchor. Truth is a weapon. And so the drift that happens in your soul because you, you slack up on your devotion to God can cause you to be totally confused and experience condemnation and guilt. And I want you to realize, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33, that God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. He is not the author of confusion, but he's the God of peace. Here's number five. You're experiencing feelings of overwhelming despair, darkness, and fear. Have you ever gotten into a place where you're just in a funk? You don't even know what's wrong with you. There's nothing that you did. You just, you just wake up, you find yourself after a while just in a funk and you can't exactly put your finger on what's wrong with you where you lost your passion your zeal your enthusiasm and, and may I say this to you you can reduce a great deal of the things that stress you out by simply not having a strong opinion about everything you don't have to have a strong opinion about everything keep your peace just hold your peace stop having a strong opinion about everything. Everything you read online, here you got to have a strong opinion. And here somebody made one little statement in that. you got to write two paragraphs, <laughs> fuming, trying to straighten out the whole world. And every place you go, stop stressing over stuff, having a strong opinion about things that don't even matter. You're losing your peace over it. You're losing your peace. And I tell you that whenever you're experiencing spiritual warfare, what happens to people normally is that they have a tendency to withdraw themselves from the very people that can help them and strengthen them and encourage them. Sometimes this is the first sign of a mental illness is that they begin to isolate themselves from the family. They start pulling away from the people that really love them and care the most about them. And, and here's the problem is that when there is a void in communication, negativity will fill it whenever there is a void in communication negativity will fill it you stop talking to people and they will not think the best concerning you they will assume the worst negativity will fill it if there's a void in communication negativity will fill it negativity will fill it because communication builds trust communication builds trust communication builds 
trust, open and honest communication builds trust. Trust generates commitment. Commitment fosters teamwork. And teamwork produces results. And when God really wants to do something in your life, he's going to allow the power of the Holy Spirit to begin to fill you with wisdom and understanding by first discerning the time and then to know what you ought to do. Because this feeling of despair and gloominess happens to some of the best of us. It happened to the prophet Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 19. This was a man that was used of God, had an anointing to be able to call down fire from heaven. He could just snap his fingers and just fire would just fall from heaven. And this is one of the instances. He had just called down the fire from heaven and, and he brought great victory over the 450 false prophets of Baal. And they were all slain. And Jezebel said, I want his head on a platter. She said, I'm going to kill you. Jezebel is not a woman. Jezebel is a spirit. It's a spirit of manipulation and control. There are male Jezebels that manipulate and control. And this manipulating spirit threatened him to such a degree. It overwhelmed his life. This was not normal. This was spiritual warfare. And he went out in the wilderness in the midst of barren land and he's suicidal and he asked God to take his life. This is the great prophet that had just done one of the most spectacular miracles of all time. And now he's depressed in a place of loneliness and isolation. And the Bible says that God hit him in the cleft of the rock and he passed by in a great whirlwind. But the Bible says God was not in the whirlwind. And after that, that was an earthquake. God began to shake to pieces the foundations of things that he'd been standing on. But it says... God wasn't in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, he says that was a fire. The Bible says God was not in the fire. And after the fire, that was a still, small voice. It was a whisper. There are some times that God will deliver you out of your depression. And there are other times when God will come into your depression with you and talk to you and whisper. When he whispers, it is his way of saying, I'm close, I'm right here. You never whisper to somebody who's a great distance away from you. Somebody who's across the field. You whisper to someone who's close. And his whisper reminded Elijah, you're not alone. And here's what the whisper said to him. Elijah, what are you doing here? God asked him a question that became his alarm clock. That was his wake-up call. He was like, this is not about you. This is about the assignment that's on your life. Trying to discourage you from doing what I put you in the earth to do. I don't know who I am talking about. But your destiny is under attack. The devil would love nothing more than for you to become so broken and discouraged that you throw your hands up and resign on God. God placed you in the earth on purpose, with purpose, and for purpose. How dare you let failure, misunderstanding, attacks, and sickness stop you? As long as there is breath in this old body of mine, I have resolved that if I live is Christ, if I die, is Christ. So whether I live or whether I die, with every breath that I have, if I were too weak to use my voice, I would take my pen and write truth and speak it in books and say, Holy Ghost, breathe on this thing in the name of Jesus. I don't know who I'm talking to, but I do know that your destiny is under attack. I know that the devil is trying to discourage you. He's trying to break your spirit. He's trying to bring you into a morass of mediocrity. He's trying to let delay so discourage you. 
that you think it's too late for me and that God has forsaken me. And that if he was going to do something in your life, he would have done it by now. The devil is a liar. The Bible says that though the vision tarry, wait for it. Wait for it. Wait for it. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. I came to tell you today, there's something on your life. There's something on your son and your daughter. The devil can't have your children. The devil cannot. He cannot. I'm talking to warriors today in the name of Jesus. Somebody that grabs a golf club. Somebody that grabs a knife. Somebody that says, devil, I came to do war with you. You will not have my family. You will not have my, my mind. You will not have my peace. You will not have my joy. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. He only needs one warrior for the whole house. To say, devil, not on my watch. Not on, your, my, not on my watch. I'm watching right now. My son and my daughter, they may be out right now, but I'm praying in the Holy Ghost. Not on my watch. Not on my watch. Lord, may you preserve that destiny. May you preserve that legacy in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. If they're involved in substance abuse, addicted to pornography, in the name of Jesus. There's a power in the blood. There's a power in the blood. There is a power in the blood. I'm going to equip you next week and begin to tell you the weapons. You coming for armament next week. I'm going to identify the powerful weapons of our warfare that are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds of the devil. I declare, I prayed, I heard this in the spirit. And I declare God has a strategy. Strategy is a war term. It's a war term. You're coming to get your weapons next week. Identify it so that you know what to use as the enemy. When the enemy comes in like a flood. Yep. That's something that God is raising up. He's raising it up. He's raising it up. There's going to be a new standard in the name of Jesus. A new standard for your family. A new standard for excellence. A new standard for not quitting. A new standard for finishing what you start. A new standard, a new standard of wealth building in your life, not poverty. In the name of Jesus. This is a new day. There is a war going on. The sound of God's soldiers' feet hitting the ground. I hear it in the spirit. God is building. He's rallying an army. He's rallying an army. There's a war cry. I heard it in the spirit. These are not just my desires to speak this. There is a war going on in the heavenlies. And there's a word from God. And I want you to be able to get it because it will empower you and strengthen you and give you God's divine strategy to be able to protect your families. But until we get to this next week, use the power of the blood. Satan, the blood is against you. Satan, the Lord rebukes you. Your families belong to God in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. He's warring for your mind. He's warring over your health. He's trying to rob you of every good and perfect gift that comes from above, from the Father of lights. He's trying to take your peace. He's trying to take your joy. He wants every good thing that God has already blessed you with. But the devil is a liar. May I remind you of this? You skip to the end of the book and you discover that we win. But thanks be unto God that gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. It comes through Jesus Christ our Lord. It comes through Jesus Christ our Lord. May you be the lamb for your household. Because wherever there's a blood over the household, he'll save whatever's in the house. 
the blood of one lamb for every house. One lamb. I don't care how many children you got. The blood of one lamb. One lamb for every house. One lamb for every house. He's just looking for somebody in the family to be able to shift your family from that craziness, from that ghetto acting stuff and mindset. He's looking for one somebody in the family that will stand in the gap and make up the hedge and declare this is the Lord's doing. And that says, Satan, you've come thus far. And now we draw a line in the sands of time to say you'll go no further. It stops here. It stops now. And you stand in that authority as a courageous warrior. Courageous warrior because the Lord is with you. The Lord is with you. And he's the commander of the battalion. And we are subject to him to be able to hear his voice. And then God rallies us. And we march under the authority of Jesus the Christ. And victory. Victory belongs to you. Victory belongs to you. Victory belongs to you. There's a war cry. There's a war cry. And he's saying, men of war, women of war, rise up. Rise up. Rise up. It's war time. And the victory is already ours. And Jesus does not lose not one that is committed to him. Not one. Not one. It's interesting that spiritual warfare is won without the shedding of our blood, but the declaration of the blood that he already shed. It is pleading the blood that was already shed. Already shed. The precious fruit of the earth. They belong to God. Father. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Jesus. For the privilege just of knowing you. God we're yours. We're yours. We're yours God. And we realize. That there's something warring in our members. Warring in our own mind. Warring in our soul. Warring in our own being, warring in our houses, warring in our neighborhoods, in our communities, warring on our jobs, warring in the media, warring, warring in the world. School against school, state against state, city against city, nation against nation, warring. Democrats against Republicans, just warring. Lord, I thank you that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. God, some have been worn out through the struggle, overwhelmed. Father, may the Prince of Peace descend on them right now in the name of Jesus. Peace, 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 peace. Lord, I thank you that you're able to give us peace in the midst of a storm. Because peace has nothing to do with the absence of storms. It has everything to do with the presence of God. Thank you for being present and bringing the peace of who you are into our lives, into our hearts, into our situations, into our circumstances. We declare, Lord, that we are yours. We declare that the earth is the Lord's and all of us who dwell herein. We belong to you, Lord, according to Psalm 24, 1. We belong to you. Lord, now use us for your glory as mighty warriors fighting your cause in the earth until righteousness rains down like water and justice like a mighty stream. We pray in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, that you give us such discernment in these times to know that you alone are God and that there is none other beside you. Thank you for washing us and cleansing us and now for using us as your servants, as your warriors. When there has come a cry in the spirit saying, who will go for us? And whom will I send? 
Lord, we let a resounding response come out of our own hearts saying, Lord, here am I. Send me. Use us, God, for your glory in the earth until peace fills every household, until order is restored, bringing us back into the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Father, clear the confusion in the minds of our young people. I pray in the name of Jesus, in the mind of elders, clear their minds, clear their hearts, clear their vision, clear their commitments. I pray clarity of the Holy Spirit come into our lives. And Father, what you've started, and you perform it unto the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name. Amen. Part two is next week. You don't want to miss it. You're going to be equipped, strengthened, strategized next Sunday. And listen next We hope that you enjoyed that message. Don't forget to like and subscribe and then press the notification bell so that you don't miss another one of our videos. And if you want to partner with us, click the Give Now button. Thank you for what you do.